continued from Cronin de Cunin playlist. Between the time when chaos broke Cadia and the return of the sons of the Emperor, there was a time undreamed of. And unto this, Cronan, destined to wear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Cronan and the Way of Bubbles Cronan stood and looked down on the field of combat. His field. For he was the biggest boss of the emergent war. None could now refute that. Mostly because he had split any recalcitrant hearts and souls in half, or torn their heads off, as he had done only recently at the massively popular Thinkmas festivities. Without Boss Rodbagger to slow them down, or Boss Redwheel to tip off the Humies to the extent they had pushed, the war now moved with a speed, certainty and precision that would have astonished even Cronan but scant five months ago. Alas, Boss Nostril Splitter still eluded capture and detention. Well, for about five seconds before Cronan could get his axe to his neck, at the very least. A small annoyance, but one Cronan would not spend much time on. Nostril Splitter would turn up, or he would not. But no matter the situation, Cronan would be ready for him. But such sundry concerns would not be permitted to detract one iota of will and concentration from the Great One this day. For he could feel it. Not cunning this time. For that now suffused his every nerve, his every ganglia, his entire being. No. Cronan felt something else rising. Glee. Unabashed, unfettered glee. For it was one thing to fight the Humies around their cities, the great protective structures, but it was another entirely to enjoy the purity of an open field, something that had not happened on Aquilonia for as long as any of the Greenskins could recall. Never before had there been orcs in such numbers, with such pride, with such gubbins and all the Penelope of war, or something like that, thought Cronan, as he looked across his mighty war for he was in fine fettle, and knew his men were of overburgeoning zeal for the scrap that was about to transpire. For days and weeks now, the humans had been manoeuvring and deploying, so blatantly and so easily spotted as to be nothing as the most audacious of challenges to Cronan's might, a challenge that could simply not be ignored. Not least because to do so would be to severely curtail the emergent majesty and legend of Cronan, but more because it was a very polite way of the Humies displaying their respect for the Orcs and giving them such a welcome invitation to a party of prodigious and sumptuous proportions. The Imperium certainly knew how to put on a spread, thought Cronan. A pity that the main delicacy, the most superb of combatants, were not present. The Space Marines. The lines of humans were predominantly made of little pink and brown and yellow Humies, all wearing their lovely uniforms rank upon rank of them, with armour and artillery aplenty. They had columns of Ogrin, Cronan was glad to see, but little else of real note. The human imperial guard, their anal militantum, were the only ones to take the field this day, it seemed. Yet Cronan de Cunin did not surrender to the potential disappointment and ennui that the lack of a real fight against space marines could have conjured within his troubled brow. He was, after all, quite a positive chap, and knew he should contend and content himself with a banquet Gork and Mork had laid before him, for he was an adherent of the great prophet of Gork and Mork, and in them he did trust. He knew that if he were to simply crush all that stood before him and his mighty war, that soon enough the real fighting would come to him. Ah, a day he looked forward to with relish. But now, to the events of the day, he need only crush these humies in the most fun and devastating way possible, earning himself and his wonderful boys that Elysian field of a future war against the marines, the Oedipi starters in High Gothic, or something like that. The space marines, 
That is all that matters. Cronan had toured his war for days now, knowing that each new morn brought more and more interesting and fun gubbins and darker and intriguing ways of waging war. He intended to use them all, for he knew exactly what he intended for his set piece. He would unleash his goth, but he would soften up the enemy first by introducing them to the new darker and know what his mech boys had been cobbling together. The humans were in for a surprise or two. Oh, yes, they were. And thus, as Cronan looked down on the plains, he laughed the deep belly laugh of the cunning. The leagues between the Orc War and the Imperium's Astro Militarum, its Imperial Guard, seemed all too short to the now disquieted army of humans. Things had seemed so certain when they had marched out in their orderly columns and formations, the grandeur of the human race preparing for war. All was organized, regimented, and orderly. Surely there could be no chance of defeat at the hands of the barbaric and imbecilic greenskins when there so much of the Emperor's own power had been mustered in one place. In their ranks they had waited for days now, every morn presenting for the orcs to see their power, their might, their determination. It was felt that there would be no battle, that the orcs would take one look at the well-oiled military machine and skulk back into their forests and crags. But that was before they actually appeared in strength. When the orc war crested the horizon, few of the men and women present were unaffected by the display. On they came, an unending tide of green. And it was only then that the spine of the guard began to slightly shift in discomfort. Those days were punctuated by a rigid and draconian enforcement of order by the officers. The commissariat wended their way through the massed ranks during the day and visited every campfire during the night. Always bluff and doughty, they heckled, hectored and harangued where it would avail the best results, but would also take the time to encourage to regale their compatriots with exploits and deeds against the Greenskins, always highlighting the lack of import of numbers, and trying to stiffen the spines and raise the elan of the men and women in their charges. So it was that on the morn the guard went out to their arranged pickets and positions, their pre-measured and marked fire lines and ranges. But in all of the hubbub, their leadership had fallen into the most cunning of Cronan's traps thus far, for they had simply not concentrated. They had simply not fathomed or encompassed their doom. They planned the battle as they had done across the length and breadth of the Imperium since its inception, and they had underestimated Cronan and his cunning, and in this their downfall was assured. For they had forgotten a few key issues, things that they had always relied upon so much as to be considered as present as air as certain as the bayonets on their weapons. Dependable. But alas, this time they were not there, and the lack would be telling. The first few hours of light were the spectacle of a war waking up and then positioning. It was heralded by an ever-growing rumble. This was not just of the growling of the greenskins either. They were to find out. As high morning arrived, the war leapt into life and surged forward, and it was few that were present amongst the Humis who did not take at least a slight step back at its advent. The first things to happen set the tempo of the entire engagement, set its course, and it soon dawned on the general in charge that he and his men were about to be dinner. As arranged, the event began with an onrush of vehicles, as the speed freaks moved like the horns of a bull towards the guard forces the van falling much slower at first. Expecting them to then charge into the ranks or even front of their army, the guard were shocked to see them swerve off at the last moment and careen around their flanks and then rear. A veritable deluge of fire was laid in front of them by the massed ranks of the guard heavy artillery. Recovering from their shock at the change in tack, the Humi officers did not concern themselves overly as they knew their artillery would make burning carcasses of the orc cavalry as it wheeled and spun around their rear. This was when their airs were rent by the thunder of Dakar von Smashoven's winds of war. Falling on their formations from out of the clouds, the orc air superiority was telling. Very. 
Blitzer bombers, burner bombers and WAS bomb blaster jets rained explosive carnage down on the back ranks and the artillery of the hapless humans, and within minutes their guns were silenced. Confusion was heightened when the rumble of the very earth hit the lines. A wave of round balls with legs and teeth were loosed and surged towards the human ranks like an avalanche. They were simply inexhaustible, and without heavy box barrage fire to cull and slow them, the squid charged with a tsunami of terror and teeth. With all of this going on, the humans did not, could not, witness the next stages as they were enacted. A mass of wagons had dragged a collection of huge orc mech guns onto the flanks, but well within range, as the human lines disgorged their last gun rounds at the oncoming wave of squigs. Thus they did not see the deluge of bubbles being released into the air above them. Like the plaything of a human child, the bubbles of brightly coloured force just floated through the air, up and then down onto the waiting humans. Many looked up and could not help but smile at this flash of beauty and serenity amidst the turbulent clangour of war. And they did until the bubbles landed. Some held out their hands to touch the first ones, like they were rare flakes of snow sent to bemuse and entrance. Alas, when the bubbles made contact, they would then explode in a wave of force of varying power. Some would slam the stuck to the ground. Others would rupture with such force that they would launch anything they touched into the air or for meters backwards into the milling army. As these detonations dotted the mid and back ranks of the army, more of the human force, more of their support and heavy elements were rendered useless as Lehman Russ and Hellhound tanks were flattened or spun into the air by the force and then fell down onto more of their own men and resources. As the waver squigs were amongst the men and women of the first picket lines, it became a massacre, for out of the dust and the screaming came the full force of the Goth clan. Cronin had harboured the power of his Goths, always using them for sledgehammer assaults on cities or locations that he had already enveloped within his war. So the armies of the Humis had thus far only really engaged speed freaks and some storm boys. They were utterly unprepared for the unfettered brutality of the Goth onward rush. And so it was that many a commissar leapt to the front of the lines in an attempt to stiffen the spines of his fellows by engaging and defeating an orc leader, only to be smashed down and slaughtered by the sheer rage of the Goth assault. And without space marines, the only things who could stand a chance against the Goths, the most orky of all orcs, was the Ogrins. A huge line of which was hastily prepared as a breakwater, a dam behind which the human force could regroup and reorganize. But it was not to be. For the mech guns of the Orc War were still in range, and the lines of dense warriors were simply lifted into the air and thrown leagues through the atmosphere by the tractor beams of the Orc mech guns. A situation that would lead to more than one mech boy being physically castigated by a surly goth later on. But the instant effect was the rout of the Ogrins, as they felt the Emperor himself was making them fly out of the way of the Orcs and punishing them. In a childlike way, they grasped that the Emperor was certainly not with them this day, and fled. And the rest was simple, brutal, fun, and final. Did I mention brutal? Good, because it was. As the last light of day dipped below the horizon, the sizzling of many a rattling foot and frame caressed the nostrils of all throughout the camp. Cronan was heralded as the best boss that had ever trod the ground of Aquilonia. For through his cunning and brutality, an army of some 40,000 humans had not only been bested, but trounced. The casualties of the orcs were considered less than a trifle, piffling. And so Cronan went to his bed of rest with the glow of Gork and Mork in his breast. He had done it. He had shown the Greenskins that they could be powerful, that they could even beat the Humies in massed engagements and this would be the last clarion call necessary to unify those larger mobs and tribes that had refused his manifest destiny up to this point. Soon they, too, would also be clamoring to join his war. And Cronan knew nothing on Aquilonia would ever be the same again.
Welcome, gentle listener. I am Voldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and war gear of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And as it is still October, I feel it high time we had a brief look at some of the most fun weapons in the entire setting, those of the mech guns. I hope I have shown some of the hilarity, but also brutality, of these zany weapons. And it just goes to show that the orcs are not just a fun faction, but one capable of eliciting bowel-liquefying reactions from all who have even a passing knowledge of their weird menagerie of monsters and mad lab of magnificent darker. That's firepower to any non-green skin, of course. So, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, Mech guns. Though no self-respecting orc would ever admit it, there is undeniable strategic value to supporting close-quarters assaults with heavy ranged firepower. Batteries of grot-crude mech guns filled this role within many warbands, the enemy quickly learning that their ramshackle appearance belies the ability to rain ferocious salvos of firepower down on all in their sights. Orcs tend to drag mech guns to the battlefield behind speed wagons before cutting them loose and leaving them in untidy heaps for the grots to sort out. The terrified gaggle of Gretchen crew rarely know what each gun will do until they pull the firing lever and witness the destruction they wreak upon the enemy, or occasionally upon themselves. Some runt herds use the threat of serving in a mech gun battery to instill discipline in their grot mobs, with rebellious or lazy runts being sent to shoot the guns. Should the miserable grot crew survive for long, they will soon become deafened and have to resort to a rudimentary system of sign language. This is rarely successful, as there are only so many signs a grot can carry around in his head. Countless weird mech guns have been fielded by greenskin warbands over the millennia, from shockwave projecting pulsar rockets and chain and shell firing hop splat guns to the crude but effective squig catapult. Yet several types of mech guns are seen again and again. Most common are custom mega cannons, bulky energy weapons powered by crackling batteries, thrumming capacitors, and whirring gubbins galore. Charged until their needles are dancing in the red, mega cannons unleash raw power that annihilates everything caught in the blast. Rather more unusual is the bizarre force field projector known as the Bubble Chucker. This peculiar weapon generates clusters of energized spheres that vary wildly in size and solidity, and are sent drifting across the battlefield to rain down upon enemy positions. Some are as big as wrecking balls, yet impact with the force of a backhand slap, while others look no larger or more fearsome than a soap bubble, yet hit hard enough to flip a chimera onto its roof. <laughs> Force fields also feature in the operations of the Smasher Gun, which traps its target in a localized energy barrier, hoists them into the air, and then, if the gun keeps working long enough and the polarity does not catastrophically reverse, crushes them like a massive invisible fist. The tractor cannon, meanwhile, fires its thrumming energies far further and is often used as an anti-aircraft weapon. Targets caught in its beams are reeled in and smashed against the ground with killing force, or at least on those occasions that the cannon does not inadvertently get pulled skywards instead, its shrieking crew still clinging to it as it sails through the air to detonate some distance away. Orky know what? Although orcs rarely find applications for them beyond the battlefield, many greenskin technologies are surprisingly advanced. A warband benefiting from the services of a big mech or two are likely to find themselves with access to energy weapons, mass transportation beams and all manner of other strange devices. A good proportion of these are too bulky to be mounted on anything smaller than a spacecraft or super heavy war engine. Yet still, there remain popular inventions that can play a significant role in battle. The force fields deployed by mechanics have frustrated the efforts of many an Imperial gunline and can be used in both offensive and defensive capabilities. 
either trapping, crushing or hurling the foe, or deflecting and dissipating incoming fire. Teleportation is another area in which orky know-whats proves remarkably effective. Greenskins have been known to teleport even Titan-class war engines, such as Gargans, directly into the fray, as well as delighting in beaming their enemies, at least constituent bits of them, all over the battlefield, at every opportunity they get. End quote. Now I hope you can see the labour of love that are my entries on the Orcs, for they epitomise one of the most important elements of the entire hobby to me. With hilarity, one can close one's eyes and open one's imagination and survey the field of glory to have the Orcs' mad and magnificent weapons come to life. Imagine the sheer confusion and panic that would be the hallmark of the use of any of these weird and wacky weapons on an army. And I would really encourage this as a usual practice. To look not at the figures in a static position, no matter how lovingly painted or arranged, but to use one's imagination to see them in motion, to witness those intercessors charging down the board, to try to actually see the darts of light and the explosions of buildings as the fray continues. For many believe this is merely a hobby of painting, gluing and throwing of dice, or of tactics and deployments, and precision moves and counter-strikes. It can be all of these things, but it can also be more. If one is willing to be just a tiny bit vulnerable to the potential ridicule from the grumpy or prosaic, then one can look down on not a board and a game, but on a titanic struggle, a movie that is under your control, your own direction. And that, for me, is one of the most fun elements of the entire whole. The imagination flying wild and the smoke of battle at my behest, like a Spielberg. I make my own movies, and I'm quite happy to share the making of them with my friends. I have been Baltimore, your faithful servant. I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction to the mech guns of the Orcs. If so, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you do, then also hit the notification button, as I would not want you to miss out. Please also be aware that a quick share of the video goes a long way to the continuation of our little site and community, if you're not able or moved enough to support us on Patreon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun.